Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about 121 tribal people who were acquitted last week after spending five years in jail. We also talk about a BJP leader who has been arrested on charges of immoral trafficking. But first, we talk about Myanmar. On Monday, Myanmar's military force junta executed four pro-democracy activists who had been arrested last year. These executions marked a new low for the situation in the country, which has been in a state of chaos since February last year, when the junta had executed a coup and ousted the recently elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Since the coup, armed civilian groups have been trying to resist the junta and in the process, hundreds have been killed and thousands have been arrested. Though an authorized execution like this has not happened in the country for more than 30 years. When we spoke to Nirupama Subramanian, Indian Express's national editor for strategic affairs, she told us who these activists were and what had led to their arrest. So this was after the coup in Myanmar, which happened last February. And there was a immediate outpouring of protests against the coup, against the military takeover of the country. There was a lot of democracy protests. People came out on the roads. So immediately they went after the people who were protesting. They put it down with a violence. With I mean, they shot people down. They were very brutal in the way they repressed these protests. And actually, the four people who were arrested, among them are two very famous people. One is known as Ko Jimmy, who's a very veteran political activist. His political activism dates back from 1988, when there was a popular a student's uprising against the general junta at that time. This uprising is now called the 88 Movement. And Ko Jimmy was a part of that. Nirupama says that for his role in the uprising, he later spent 20 years in prison. And uh, the second person who has been arrested is called Fyo Ziar Thao. He is uh, known in Myanmar as uh, one of the earliest hip-hop artists in that country. And from the beginning, he has been sending out political messages through his lyrics, through his songs. And the junta targeted him as well because he had great mobilizing ability and he had gone on uh, social media asking people to come out and revolt. And same with uh, Ko Jimmy, he had also sent out messages saying people should come out and revolt. The other two are less well known and they were arrested for allegedly killing suspected informant of the junta. That was back in April. Ko Jimmy was arrested in October and Fiozyar Thao was arrested in uh, November. They were convicted by a military court in January and you don't know basically what happens in these military courts because uh, they are uh, not open to the public, held behind closed doors. And the charges that they were helping uh, to arm people who were, you know, opposing the junta, they had bought weapons, they had procured weapons, and they were providing these weapons to the militias that were arranged against the junta. And that they were uh, participating and mobilizing people to rally against the junta. And she says that these acts of resistance have actually become terrorist offences. And plus, Junta has made sure that many of these offences attract the death penalty. So these now came under the death penalty and they were awarded the death penalty in January this year. But still no one thought that it would be carried out because uh, there have been several people who have been sentenced to death. But... There has been a kind of embargo that the even the junta was observing since 1988. And of course, from 2012, when they slowly began this controlled transition to a controlled democracy, there have been no, I think it is fairly certain that there were no executions at that 
time. So this has come as a big shock in Myanmar and to the international community because it's after 1988, one can say that people have been executed in Myanmar. And execution of political prisoners, especially because these are political prisoners, these are not criminals accused of any heinous crimes. They are basically exercising their right to a political protest. We don't even know how they've been executed. There's no information whether they were hanged or whether they were shot dead. You know, we have no information about that. It's quite horrific, actually, if you think about it. And this is the reason why these executions have been severely criticized across the globe. In fact, many countries and organizations like the United Nations have been asking the junta to stop their violence and persecution. But it seems that with these executions, the junta has sent out a clear message. That they will brook no resistance and they've made an example out of these people, out of these four guys. If you persist in opposing us, this fate will be the fate of others as well. So beware. I think this is a message that they have tried to send out to their domestic audiences and the international audiences just plain defiance of the international community. They've gone back to their insularity. They've taken Myanmar all the way back to the 1990s. The thing is that since 1962, Myanmar had been under a full military rule. Though in 1990, nearly 30 years later, the junta allowed elections to take place. And in these elections, Aung San Suu Kyi won by an overwhelming majority. But despite that, the junta refused to give up power, decided to cancel the results of the elections and arrested Aung San Suu Kyi. It then continued to stay in power for another 22 years, all the way up till 2011. Though after that, it seemed that the junta was undertaking some reforms and was planning to move towards a hybrid system of military rule and democracy. So people thought the junta was changing. It had realized that it needed the world for its uh, economy, for, you know, because it had realized that it could not handle all the needs of the country just by closing doors and, you know, being the insular kind of uh, institution that it was. But this attempt to transition did not work. Because when elections were held last year and Aung San Suu Kyi won them again, like she had in 1990, the junta once again decided to cancel the results and come back to power. This is what Nirupama means when she says that the country has gone back to that time. Now, many countries have criticized and condemned the actions of the junta. But Nirupama says that India has walked a very fine line when it comes to Myanmar. And that has been the case since the 90s, when it first decided to engage with the junta because there were security concerns at that time in the Northeast, which were very pressing and important for us. All sorts of militant groups in the Northeast were finding safe haven in Myanmar, and it was thought uh, necessary to engage with the military there in order to flush out these safe havens and not to get them to crack down on these militants. So there were real security concerns that, that India had. And security concerns in the region continue to be there especially considering Myanmar also shares a border with China. This is the reason why perhaps since the coup last year, India has not outright condemned the junta. Though it has urged it to stop the violence and go back to transitioning into a democracy. But countries like the US and Australia have even imposed sanctions on Myanmar and have also been putting pressure on India to take a stronger stance. And now with these executions, that pressure might increase on India to take a harder line on the junta. So it, we have to see how India responds to that. And I mean, it is going to be a tightrope walk. And next we talk about Chhattisgarh. Back in 2017, a Maoist attack had taken place near the Burkapal village in Chhattisgarh. In this attack, 25 CRPF personnel were killed and their weapons and ammunition were looted. After this happened, the police arrested 127 people, including six miners from several villages in the area, for allegedly helping the attackers. 
these people were booked under the draconian unlawful activities prevention act or uapa which is an anti terrorism law and makes it very hard for people to get bail now last week after spending 5 years in jail a special national investigation agency court acquitted 121 people in the matter while acquitting them the court said that the prosecution could not prove that they were either on the spot of the incident were in possession of any arms or explosives or were even members of the cpi maoist after they were released indian express's gargi verma visited their village she now joins us to talk about what she saw there so i visited burkapal village which is the closest village to the spot where 25 security personnel lost their lives in 2017 in which case 121 people were arrested under uapa now these guys were not arrested for actually attacking the personnel they were arrested for aiding and abetting the maoist organization and helping a banned organization this is a common practice across chatisgarh especially the left wing extremist affected areas where after a skirmish an encounter or an attack the local villagers are the first that come under suspicion yeah usually the security forces end up thinking that maoists take help of the local people to do these attacks see the security personnel are mostly outsiders right and the tribals are the locals that is what increases the suspicion as well and uh, they are subjected to a lot of questioning if not more so burkapal had also seen its fair share of questioning one of the residents who was later arrested and has now been acquitted also told us about how his brother was allegedly killed by the security forces when we reached the village shashank there was a meeting going on interestingly and the meeting was with all the village elders and the people who had been acquitted from that village so the 36 people from burkapal village the 121 are from several other villages as well the meeting was about how much money was owed and how much money was spent on each person who was incarcerated and the second agenda of the meeting was to discuss about what to do of all the motherless children in the village so the tribal customs give freedom to the women to leave the marriage in case they are not happy and none of the women wanted to stay back in the village with their husbands gone nobody to feed them nobody to take care of the children so most of them have remarried and gone away this is a very unique problem that could only occur in a tribal hinterland which burkapal is currently facing so that were their primary two agendas and then of course there is a sense of foreboding as to there are several people in the village who have not been there for the past 5 years so they are absorbing their surroundings they are getting accustomed to the sunlight uh, some of the men told us as to how they couldn't see in sunlight a few days after being released because they had just gotten used to darkness living in their cells so the entire mood was of um, a lot of like they have collectively gone through the entire 5 years and 2 months that that their men have been incarcerated and uh, as under trials the village has fought as one and now as one it has welcomed its people back but now they are unsure of what to do anymore because they have come to dwindling resources dwindling energies and very changed social dynamics right like you mentioned that a lot of these men you know their wives have moved on and in your piece you also talk about this man after he came out he could not even recognize his daughter because she had grown up so much but you also mentioned that in this meeting they were also talking about how much money was spent on each person while they were in jail so talk about that aspect a bit because from what we understand the village really rallied behind these people so the men were jailed in the jagdalpur central jail which is around 4 hours from sukma headquarters and more from the village that we are talking about burkapal to be able to travel to just meet these people is also an expensive deal at that the expense of a lawyer the expense of upkeeping these men without jobs without doing what they do which is subsistence farming keeping them alive well fed and taken care of inside jail all of these things cost money in fact uh, some of the village elders told us conservatively they had had to spend 40000 per year per person which for them is astronomical sum right so they have had to sell off their cows 
families have had to sell off their land, whatever meager belongings they had. Families have had to sell off their jewelry. They have had to loan money from other wealthier relatives. So not only are these people just barely managing, now they are also under a lot of debt. And not everybody is equally in debt. I mean, say, for instance, in Hunga's family, there's this guy Hunga that I talk about in the story as well. He's the only one who's gone to jail. So his family has to only take care of one person. But in Muchaki Nanda's family, his father and his uncle both have gone to jail. So the expenses are not equally shared by everybody in terms of the people that they have in jail. But the village did not have any differences between who they were spending for. If one of them needed money, it didn't matter whose family he came from. They all sort of paid money. But now, since the trial is now over, they have to now settle the debt, you know, as to how much is to be paid by whom, which is what they were discussing. The amount of uh, money that these guys have spent just to ensure that their men come out in the past five years, that itself is a phenomenal, which activist Bela Bhatia actually says that the process becomes the punishment. And because now these guys, even when they do start working, will not be working from the place where they had left. They will be working from a place of debt, which they have to pay off by a certain amount of time. So it has set them back a lot, but at least like they don't hold any grudge about it because they are glad they are out of jail. They think that at least they have gotten their life back, whatever it may look like right now. Yeah, plus it also must be tiring, right? Because you have lost five years of your life when you didn't do anything wrong. Your partner has moved on. You are now in debt. And just to even hold on to that anger, it must be tiring, right? Because it does require a lot of energy to fight the system. Very right, Shashank. Because that is what it is for most of these men. They don't have the energy to fight anymore, very honestly. Okay, and Gargi, you also spoke to the activist Bela Bhatia for the story. And one thing that she has been pointing out is that there are several such people languishing in jails and awaiting trials, right? Yes, yeah, Shashank. Bela Bhatia herself was uh, representing some of the accused in this case that have been acquitted. There are several other cases that she says she has dealt with over the years where similarly people have been languishing even without a trial. So one interesting thing about the Burkapal trial was that till 2020, the trial had not moved one inch. In fact, in 2020, the then DGP had written to the IG Bastar saying that this trial needs to be fastened. And then eventually, slowly, the trial had come on track. But there are so many other cases in which trial is still not started. In fact, not all from the Burkapal attack case have been acquitted because some eight of them are involved in other cases as well. Now, it is for the court and the police to decide if um, these other cases are valid or if these people need to be acquitted and released from jail. But that will only happen when the trials sort of move. So it is harsh reality of Bastar, like several activists, lawyers, the Jagdalpur Legal Aid Group, everybody has pointed out that several innocents are behind bars on these fake Naxal charges under draconian laws like UAPA, which makes their bail even more difficult. And in the end, we talk about Meghalaya. Yesterday, the police arrested Meghalaya BJP Vice President Bernard Marak, who has been accused of running a brothel at his farmhouse. Marak had actually been on the run and was caught by the Uttar Pradesh police last evening. When we spoke to Indian Express's Tora Agarwala, she told us how the matter first came to light. So, on 22nd July, the police carried out a raid uh, in one of his properties. I mean, he calls it a resort on the outskirts of Tura town in the Garo Hills in Meghalaya. And this property is owned by Bernard Marak. She says that in this raid, the police found out that the property had some 30 rooms and they also recovered over 400 bottles of liquor, 49 mobile phones, some sharp weapons, contraceptive tablets, and some unused condoms. And apart from that, they found, which is the most uh, incriminating bit of it, is that they found uh, five minors locked up in a room in that particular property. And uh, the police claim that these five minors were kept in this very small and hygienic room. And when they were found, they looked very shocked. 
looked and they looked like you know they were in trouble so this was on 22nd july and the police also say that they carried out this raid because of another case and this case goes back to february when in the same intura only a child went missing and later it was found that that particular minor girl had been actually sexually assaulted and they found that she was sexually assaulted in this particular property owned by uh, bernard marak this is the reason why they decided to conduct this raid in the first place in a statement on saturday evening the police said they detained 73 youths including 23 women and rescued five minors from the property and they later charged marak under the immoral trafficking prevention act but so far marak has insisted that nothing untoward was happening on his property and that he had actually been financially supporting the children found by the police and he said that he was basically victim of a whole political conspiracy because i mean he claimed that he is growing popular in the garo hills and as is the bjp and the npp which is the senior party in the ruling coalition like it's the lead party conrad sangma's party the npp is feeling threatened so they sort of cooked up all these allegations against him and they try to frame him and meanwhile the bjp state unit in meghalaya has supported marak and said that he is a victim of political vendetta by its coalition partner the national people's party which is currently in power in the state so the state bjp has put their support behind marak we should remember the bjp is a junior partner in the coalition there are just two mlas in meghalaya in this particular alliance so yeah and the npp has in the beginning they haven't put out a statement or anything you know and in the beginning they were not giving comments but in the last two days when journalists have asked them both the chief minister and the deputy chief minister they've said that you know this is happening as per law and they rubbish the allegations that this was some political conspiracy and that they have nothing to do with it and because there was a earlier case of sexual assault in the property that is why the police went and raided this place and it had nothing to do with politics so that's what they are saying and they are saying let law take its own course you know i spoke to the superintendent of police of the west garo hills and even he said that i am under no political pressure it's only because previous sexual assault case happened in this particular property it is our duty to look into what goes on in this property and because he is the owner of this property he is answerable to us and yeah so i mean we had to go and do the raid and investigate You are listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at IndianExpress dot com.